It is Northern Lights season here again. The longer nights of autumn without those freezing temperatures of winter are the perfect time to head north and see the aurora. Hence the explosion of images and videos on social media that you might have seen recently. And after seeing those videos, you might have had some questions about what causes the aurora and why are they always that exact same color of green? And then the same thing that Taylor Swift did recently. I am an astrophysicist and a massive Swifty, and I can tell you that the Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights are green because of oxygen glowing in our atmosphere. Now to understand why it does that, and crucially, why it's always the exact same color of green, wherever you are in the world, we need to dive into a little bit of the physics behind what goes on in the sun and some quantum physics as well. Now, the aurora all starts with the sun. Now, the sun might look like a constant calm disk of light in the sky, but taking a closer look reveals how chaotic it actually is. The sun, like all stars, is essentially a huge ball of hot gas, also known as a plasma, that is in a constant fight against gravity crushing inwards. But at the very center of the sun in its core, it's dense enough and hot enough to fuse four atoms of hydrogen together to make helium. And that process produces energy that then pushes outwards back against the force of gravity crushing it inwards. This fusion also produces warmth and light that's very handy for us here on Earth. The outer atmosphere of the sun, which has always been called the corona, can then be heated to such a point that the particles of gas in the corona can be given so much energy that they can escape the pull of the sun's gravity. These particles then stream off the sun in what's known as the stellar wind. Charged particles like protons and electrons sent out into space at high speed. Sometimes these particles get tangled up in the sun's magnetic field as well, so the pressure builds and builds and builds to the point where the sun burps them up in one fell swoop known as a coronal mass ejection, which can happen anywhere from one every five days to three times a day. Either way, potentially dangerous high energy charged particles stream off the sun every single day in all directions, and some of them can end up encountering Earth. Now, luckily for us here on the ground, the Earth has a couple of defense mechanisms to help protect us from this, kind of like the skin on an apple. The Earth has got its atmosphere and its magnetic field to help shield us from these high energy particles. The Earth is just one big giant magnet generated by all that liquid iron just sloshing around and moving around in its core. You know, it's why compass needles that also have little magnets on the end of them always point towards the Earth's north magnetic pole. Now we can visualize what magnetic fields actually look like with just a simple bar magnet and some tiny little chips of iron which nicely arrange themselves along the magnetic field lines that are all concentrated at the poles. The charged particles in the sun's solar wind follow similar paths around the Earth's magnetic field, rebuffed by the outer field lines and then funneled down to the poles, where it hits the atmosphere, which contains lots of oxygen and nitrogen. And this is when the colours of the aurora are produced through something known as ionization. So all those charged particles that have been burped up by the sun encounter the magnetic field of the Earth first, and then the Earth's next line of defense, the atmosphere. And those charged particles collide with atoms of oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere, transferring energy to them, which is what causes them to glow. To understand why they glow, we need to do just a little bit of chemistry and some quantum physics too. It was Danish physicist Niels Bohr that figured out the structure of an atom with a central positive nucleus orbited by negative electrons around it. But they would only do so at certain distances from the nucleus in what he called shells. And those shells were only stable if there was a certain number of electrons 
in them. Sometimes it was two and sometimes it was eight electrons depending on the distance from the center. It was then Austrian physicist Wolfgang Pauli that applied his knowledge of quantum physics, i.e. how particles behave on very tiny scales, to show that these were the only distances that electrons could orbit the center of an atom because of the amount of energy needed to do so. If an electron had less or more energy, it couldn't make a stable orbit around the nucleus. This is why each element in the periodic table is so unique, because the electrons in each atom have these specific configurations defined by quantum mechanics only allowed in certain places that can't be replicated by any other element. So oxygen has eight electrons orbiting around it, two in the first shell, then only six in its outer shell. But remember, Niels Bohr worked out that the shells were only stable if the shell had two or eight electrons in it. This is what makes oxygen so reactive. It's constantly looking for other atoms to bond with that can help fill those two empty electron spaces. So if we go back to our oxygen atoms in the atmosphere that are getting hit by these high energy particles from the sun, what happens is those high energy particles transfer energy to the electrons in the oxygen atom, in the same way that a cue ball in a game of pool or snooker can transfer energy to the colored balls. What that means for our oxygen atom is that one of the electrons then gains energy, which you can use to essentially jump up to what we call the next shell or the next energy level, the next place that it's allowed to orbit around the center of the nucleus give it more energy, and it will jump up to an even higher shell. Problem is, that configuration of electrons is even more unstable, so it doesn't stay in that higher shell very long. Instead, it drops back down, gives out the energy that it just absorbed from one of those high energy particles from the sun, and releases it as light, in a process that we call fluorescence. Now we see this across nature, but we've also used it to our advantage as well to make things like neon lights. Now remember, quantum mechanics tells us that there's only certain allowed distances or energies that electrons can orbit around in an atom. So those shells are always separated by the exact same amount of energy. In every single oxygen atom in the world, in the universe. So it means that when that electron drops back down, the same amount of energy is always released, meaning that it's always the same wavelength of light. More energetic light has more waves arriving every second, so there's a shorter distance between each of those waves. That's what we call the wavelength. Things like x-rays and UV light are very high energy light, whereas less energetic light has less waves arriving every second, and therefore a longer distance between each wave. Stuff like infrared light or radio light is a less energetic light. For visible light that we can see with our eyes, that change in wavelength gives us the rainbow of colors that we see. So more energetic visible light has a shorter wavelength, which is a blue color, and less energetic visible light has a longer wavelength, which is a red color. So because that energy difference between those shells where the electrons can orbit is always the same in every single oxygen atom, the same wavelength of light is always given out, giving us the exact same color of light. The most common way this happens for oxygen atoms means that light with a wavelength of 557.7 nanometers is given out, or 0.000000557 meters, which, you guessed it, is a green color. Now, it's also possible to get red light from oxygen atoms as well through this ionization process, which you sometimes also see in the aurora. But that electron jump between shells is less likely, and it's made less likely still if you have any collisions between oxygen atoms in the atmosphere. So where we do see it is where the air is less dense, where there are less likely to be collisions much higher up in the atmosphere. Also, our eyes are just generally less sensitive to red light 
than they are to green light. So these red colors tend to only show up in photographs that are taken with camera equipment way more sensitive than our eyes, which reveals them as this transition from red higher up in the atmosphere to green lower in the atmosphere that shows these different electron jumps are happening. Looking at that video I just showed as well, you might also be wondering why is there this almost abrupt stop that happens at the bottom of the aurora, which is around about 100 kilometers or 60 miles up into the atmosphere. Because it's not like we don't have oxygen down here at roughly sea level, we're all breathing fairly happily, right? But it's because we don't have single atoms of oxygen. We have molecular oxygen, O2. Two atoms of oxygen bonded together, sharing their electrons to get that magic number of eight electrons in a shell. That is what we breathe, and it's very stable. You need a huge amount of energy to ionize it, and so it's very rare that it ever happens. So it's atomic oxygen, single atoms of oxygen that are giving us that green light. And if you look at the concentration of atomic oxygen in our atmosphere with altitude, with height in the atmosphere, you'll see that most of it is found at around 100 kilometers high, after which the amount drops off really steeply. This is because oxygen atoms want to be in a molecule of O2. They want to find another atom that they can bond with and share those electrons so that they can become incredibly stable. But incredibly high energy UV light from the sun has other ideas. If a molecule of O2 is hit by one of these UV photons, these UV particles of light, it can cause it to break apart. But as you get lower and lower and lower in the atmosphere, there's been more and more absorption of that UV light, breaking apart those molecules and keeping them as atoms of oxygen higher up in the atmosphere, but as you get lower and lower and lower, most of it's gone, and so the oxygen can happily exist as O2. Also, fun fact, the aurora aren't unique to Earth. We see them on other planets too, since those planets also have magnetic fields. They're particularly spectacular on Jupiter and Saturn, but the glow that's given off is usually an ultraviolet wavelength that we wouldn't be able to see with our eyes. So we're incredibly lucky to even be able to see our aurora on Earth. Now, admittedly, I've only ever been lucky enough to see the Northern Lights once, and it wasn't from the ground, it was from the window of a plane somewhere over Canada flying from the US to the UK. That's one reason to always get a window seat. Seeing them from the plane window though has made me be like, right, it is time. I should plan a special trip somewhere in the world to go and see them from the ground. So let me know in the comments if there is anywhere that you know of that's a particularly like spectacular, just incredible location that I should go and see them from. Because while I technically could just wait for the sun to do a particularly intense burp of plasma so that the northern lights are visible as far south as the UK, taking a trip up north or, you know, really far south down to like Antarctica to see the Aurora Australis or the southern lights just sounds like way more fun to me than waiting around. Anyway, here's hoping that next time Taylor Swift or anyone else searches for why are the Aurora Borealis green, let's hope they find this video. If you did just that, especially after listening to Snow on the Beach, let me know down in the comments. Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to say a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this week's video. Brilliant is a website and app with interactive courses on a huge range of topics across science, maths, and computer science, with new content added every single month. Now, I've been collaborating with Brilliant to bring you a curated series of courses that cover all of the core concepts behind the stuff that we chat about in my videos. This special Dr. Becky learning path walks you step by step through these concepts, letting you ramp up quickly on the basics or skip ahead to more advanced topics. And because this is brilliant, every lesson is hands-on and interactive so that you're learning by doing the way I know that I learn best. 
So if that sounds like fun to you, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky. That link is in the video description down below as well. And you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Scroll down and you'll also find the link to my learning path. So thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. I just love the idea of like a couple of Swifties being like, yeah, why is the Aurora Borealis? green and then just finding me like yeah me this this is my niche this is the the, the venn diagram that i intersect of like astrophysicist and swifty that's me right there it's me hi <laughs> i'm the problem it's me and then funneled down to the poles where it encounters oxygen and nitrogen nitrogen <laughs> nitrogen i feel like that could have been a really cool like comic book why why doesn't nitrogen exist or if she does I need to read this comic. <laughs> Either way, you know, you've got these high energy particles that have just been screaming, screaming, streaming, not screaming, space and sound words are harder. <laughs> Can you imagine if it was screaming though? <laughs> just like the sun is just there like, bah! just got this stellar wind. <laughs> oh, it used to be Friday already. <laughs>